Tamar seduces her father-in-law, but who is found to be righteous in the end? Hello friends, and welcome to another episode of the Bible Paladin. Last time we began the story of Joseph and heard how he was sold into slavery by his brothers. That narrative will be put on pause as we focus on his brother Judah and some very questionable decisions that he makes. Are you stupid or something? And while the story may seem out of place, we will see some parallels once we return to the story of Joseph. And one of the questions that is often asked is when would have these events taken place? And based on the timeline, which we will see later, it seems that Judah was most likely married before they sold Joseph into slavery, and then the drama and the events that follow would have happened while Joseph was away in Egypt. And like some of the other stories in Genesis that deal with relationships, we will be getting into some adult content today. And with that being said, we ask the Lord to bless our reading and reflection on the sacred word. About that time, Judah parted from his brothers and pitched his tent near a certain Adulamite named Hira. There he met the daughter of a Canaanite named Shua, married her, and had relations with her. She conceived and bore a son, whom she named Ur. Again, she conceived and bore a son, whom she named Onan. Then she bore still another son, whom she named Shelah. They were in Chezib when he was born. Judah got a wife named Tamar for his firstborn, Ur. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, greatly offended the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, Unite with your brother's widow in fulfillment of your duty as brother-in-law, and thus preserve your brother's line. Onan, however, knew that the descendants would be not counted as his, so whenever he had relations with his brother's widow, he wasted his seed on the ground to avoid contributing offspring for his brother. What he did greatly offended the Lord, and the Lord took his life too. Thereupon Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Stay as a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he feared that Shelah also might die like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. The first sentence of the section already has a deeper meaning. The Hebrew phrase is that Judah went down or descended away from his brothers. Taken literally, this could mean that he went to Adullam, which was a lower elevation from where he was. However, typically even today, Jews will always say that one goes up to a place that is holy, such as Jerusalem, and everywhere else is down in comparison. To dwell in a holy place means to be in the presence of God, both physically and spiritually. So when Judah goes down, he descends from his family, that being Israel, and moves away from them in the same way. He descends morally. This is further illustrated by the fact that he is friends with an Edomite and goes to live near him. Judah is being influenced by forces outside of his family. Not only that, he marries a Canaanite woman and produces offspring with her. He behaves like Ishmael and Esau before him, instead of what the true heirs of God's promise are supposed to do. Remember how insistent Abraham and Isaac were that their sons marry within the family? However, some rabbis have attempted to lessen the severity of the situation by interpreting Canaanite simply as merchant, which is seen in some other texts. However, based on the context, this doesn't seem to be the case. Also, we are not even told of his wife's name. She is simply known as the daughter of Shua the Canaanite. We learn that they have three sons, and in keeping with the assertion that they are living amongst the bad influence of the Canaanites, it should come as no surprise that they do not follow the Lord. Then we are introduced to another woman who will play prominently in the story, Tamar. Judah arranges for his firstborn to marry her, but due to his wickedness, he is struck down by the Lord before they have any children. We are not told of his sin, but this follows the theme of this family falling away from God. With Ur dead, Judah sets up his next son with Tamar. And this is in reference to a practice that would be later known as the Leverite Law from Deuteronomy 25.5. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her, and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, it seems that Onan does not want to father a child that would not be considered his in terms of lineage and inheritance. Rather, it would be that of his brothers. And so, of course, his name gets memorialized in the word Onanism, which in this case means coitus interruptus, or in the vernacular, pulling out. And this greatly offends the Lord, and Onan too is struck dead. The punishment is not so much for the act itself, but for his motive behind the act. He does it deliberately so as not to provide offspring for his family. 
And of course, throughout Genesis, we have seen this is one of the driving force of the promise that God has made with the family of Abraham. In fact, God has not given a lot of mandates at this point, but one of the first was be fertile and multiply. At the time of these events, it seems that Judah's third son, Shua, is too young to marry. So he sends Tamar away to live in her father's house until the time comes. However, Judah is afraid that perhaps Tamar is behind the death of his sons, possibly being cursed in some way, because he has no intention of giving her to his only remaining son. So let us continue and see what happens next. Years passed, and Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. After Judah completed the period of mourning, he went up to Timnah for the shearing of his sheep, in company with his friend Hira the Adulamite. When Tamar was told that her father-in-law was on his way up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garb, veiled her face by covering herself with a shawl, and sat down at the entrance to Enaim, which is on the way to Timnah. For she was aware that, although Shelah was now grown up, she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he mistook her for a harlot, since she had covered her face. So he went over to her at the roadside, and not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he said, Come, let me have intercourse with you. She replied, What will you pay me for letting you have intercourse with me? He answered, I will send you a kid from the flock. Very well, she said, provided you leave a pledge until you send it. And Judah asked, What pledge am I to give you? She answered, Your seal and your cord, and the staff you carry. So he gave them to her and had intercourse with her, and she conceived by him. When she went away, she took off her shawl and put on her widow's garb again. Judah sent the kid by his friend, the Adulamite, to recover the pledge from the woman, but he could not find her. So he asked the men of the place, Where is the temple prostitute, the one by the roadside in the name? But they answered, There has never been a temple prostitute here. He went back to Judah and told him, I could not find her. And besides, the men of the place said there was no temple prostitute there. Let her keep the things, Judah replied. Otherwise, we shall become a laughingstock. After all, I did send her the kid, even though you were unable to find her. About three months later, Judah was told that his daughter-in-law Tamar had played the harlot and was then with child from her harlotry. Bring her out, cried Judah. She shall be burned. But as they were bringing her out, she sent word to her father-in-law. It is by the man to whom these things belong that I am with child. Please verify, she added whose seal and cord and whose staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, She is more in the right than I am, since I did not give her my son, Shelah. But he had no further relations with her. The next part of the story opens up with the death of Judah's wife. And after he does the customary mourning for her, he sets out on a business trip with his friend Hira, the Adumalite, whom we had heard about earlier. And somehow word gets out to Tamar, who is still childless and unmarried, because Judah had basically abandoned her. And so she goes out to a place where she knew that Judah would be passing by, and she plays the harlot, as the saying goes. I'm in the mood for some fun. Her face, of course, would be covered. So Judah doesn't recognize her, but takes no time before inquiring about her services and offers her a goat in payment. She requests a few items that will identify him later so that she can collect on the price. Of course, she doesn't plan on collecting it right away because she wants to make sure that she's pregnant for this to go as planned. Judah then sends his friend Hira to deliver the goat, but when he can't find her, he begins asking around about the prostitute. And of course, no one knows of any prostitution business going on in a name, although there certainly was the practice of temple prostitutes during this time in Canaan. Judah must be getting a bit embarrassed at this point, so he decides to drop the issue before people start gossiping about him. Time passes and Judah is informed that Tamar is pregnant due to her acting like a harlot. Judah is outraged and demands that she be killed for such a crime. In dramatic fashion, Tamar produces the objects that he had given her, testifying not only to his action, but also that he is the father. Judah quickly acknowledges that they are his and admits wrongdoing. He also does not condemn her, but says that she is justified because he did not give her his son, Shelah. While there is certainly a double standard on the issue of prostitution, Judah's acknowledgement of guilt is based more on the injustice that he put Tamar through based on their marriage customs. So let's finish the chapter and see what happens with the birth of her children. When the time of her delivery came, she was found to have twins in her womb. While she was giving birth, one infant put out his hand, and the midwife, taking a crimson thread, tied it on his hand to note that this one came out first. 
But as he withdrew his hand, his brother came out, and she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. So he was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out. He was called Zerah. Like Rebekah, Tamar gives birth to twins. And like Esau and Jacob, they seem to be fighting to see who will emerge first and win the birthright. The midwife quickly ties the thread around the first hand to come out, but then the other bursts forth and is born before his brother. And of course, this activity is, becomes the origin for their names and also foreshadows elements of their lives that will follow. There has been much commentary, therefore, on who was really considered the firstborn. For in subsequent genealogies, Perez is listed first and not Zerah, who was identified with the scarlet thread. Also, it is from the line of Perez that King David is descended. Ultimately, as we have seen before, the Lord is really not concerned with who the older son is. So what is the theological message that we can glean from these passages? One is that those who are supposed to be the righteous descendants of Israel do not continue with the good work in which they begin. This goes back to when Reuben planned on saving Joseph from his brothers. He is never able to go back and retrieve him from the well. Judah also attempts to save him by suggesting that he be sold, but he never makes any attempt to bring him home. Judah then leaves his brothers and marries outside the family, essentially interrupting God's plan. His son Onan certainly doesn't finish what he started, and then Judah leaves Tamar without husband or offspring. And when she does trick him, he doesn't return with the payment himself. In fact, he sends his friend to do it, once again, not following up on his own actions. An overarching message is that God gives his children opportunities to fulfill his will, to do the right thing but they continuously find ways to abandon the straight path and refuse to cooperate with God's plan. I am reminded of what Jesus says in Luke's gospel. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Judah had an opportunity to follow the Lord, but continuously looked back and allowed himself to be paralyzed by fear and give in to his temptations. Tamar, on the other hand, is seen to be the righteous one in this story. Although, like Jacob, her actions may not be seen as moral by today's standards. She did trick her father-in-law, but she did so in order to accomplish what he prevented her from doing, and that is to provide offspring for his family. And she didn't do this out of lust or even revenge, although the way in which she uncovered his guilt may have been a bit satisfying. But ultimately, he acknowledged his own guilt and said that she was justified for her actions. In addition to the Leverite law that Judah dismissed, there was also a Hittite law that stated if all the brothers died, the widow should marry her late husband's father. Is any of this still relevant for us today? How might God still speak through these stories? And one takeaway that I see is that sometimes the reason behind an action is more important than the action itself. This is not to say that the ends justify the means, but the importance of seeing the bigger picture. God's plan for Israel's family was pretty basic at this point in the story and has been repeated in promise after promise. They will be a great nation and will occupy the land that the Lord gives them. Judah goes against this plan repeatedly. Tamar, on the other hand, tries to remedy the situation, which allows her to continue the line of Judah. Her actions fit for the culture in which she lived, and she is remembered for her strength and cunning. It is interesting that she is one of the few women that is in the genealogy of Jesus that is recorded in Matthew's Gospel. For Christians, Jesus seems to be more concerned about how our lives reflect our faith rather than a strict adherence to the law. In fact, he boils down the entire law and the prophets into the mandate to love God and to love neighbor. And if we measure everything we do by these two principles, all else seems to fall into place. Thank you so much for joining me, and hopefully these reflections rekindle your desire to read and study the Bible. Please join me next time as we continue to journey with Joseph in Egypt. Until then, seek to know God and do good.